Thank you all for coming. What a great group. We've got a terrific group of advocates and people who care and friends. And um, I, I'm Wendy Keyes, and I just wanted to say a few words uh, before we begin the questions. I'm so personally delighted that we're showing this film in the Sag Harbor Cinema. Uh, and thank you to Julia for making room for it. Uh, we were, <laughs> yes. Um, the film was due to be shown in a different context here. Julie and I had worked uh, with the people at the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, and we were devising um, a, a version of the New York New York uh, Festival, and it was we were going to have our debut um, season here this month. Sadly, uh, shockingly, actually, the uh, the festival has been canceled and. Um, we're kind of left in the lurch, but we we are delighted to have this opportunity to show what would have been opening night. Also, um, Pam's films sort of won the contest of who had more films shown in this f long festival over decades. She had seven films shown, and as you can see, the the quality of her work actually aligned very well with the uh, the core mission of the organization. So. This is really, for me, a bittersweet occasion. It, um, it uh, you know, I founded it 35 years ago with Fabiano Canosa at the Public Theater. And uh, we were very proud watching it grow into this global entity that had huge impact, both for uh, filmmakers and for human rights advocates. But that's the bitter part. The sweet part is that we have the filmmakers here. And uh, you've seen this wonderful film. So I'd just like to start by asking you, Pam, if you could uh, tell us, or either of you, um, the, the, what you mean by the line within us, or within, as part of the title. It's really what every undocumented person carries inside them because at any moment they can be captured, harassed, incarcerated, and then finally deported. And many deported back to places where they face death or serious violence against them or starvation. And so um, I felt really fortunate in the making of this film that immigrants and immigrant families let me into their lives and into their spaces where they talked about this fear. They talk about the fear with each other a lot. And when I saw them and heard them talking about the fear, I just thought, how can we cinematically transmit that feeling to a general audience that may not understand the totality psychologically of living with that fear day in and day out. And that's why that part of the title had to be connected to Borderland. So, that's great, it works. And you, but the, because you have the, uh, the private stories, the personal stories that are interspersed and juxtaposed with the most fascinating human, uh, digital humanists who uh, I, I, I've never heard of such a, a field, but neither did I. No, how did you find them, and how did you convince them to to cooperate with you? I found them online. I was researching, trying to deeply research everybody who was doing anything to speak out about what was happening in the United States in the early days of the Trump administration, when there was family separation and the Muslim ban and all of the draconian measures that were being put into place. And I saw that Alex Hill um, had an email address on the website, and so I just wrote to him. And he invited Paco and me up to Columbia University, and we went out to lunch, and we hit it off immediately. And so we devised this idea for um, including the leading members of the XP method in the film in a kind of a way. It was actually a very, I was explaining to Wendy earlier that that shoot uh, where we get the XP method was two days right after the uh, emergency, the COVID emergency was declared on March 13th. And we got kicked out of Columbia University with all our equipment. 
and they shut it down not just for us but i mean everybody and um and we were fortunate to find a an empty space in sunset park brooklyn and we holed up in there for two days and set up the set and this is how we got uh this incredible font of information that xp method is and uh we were just blown away too by what they were revealing uh so and we wanted to shoot it in a we wanted to make it a liminal space we almost subversive in a good way you know like good trouble like good subversion um and 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 so that was the idea for the background and how we lit it but it really resembled where they work out of anyway we just kind of amped it up a little bit you know for cinema and is immigration their their field or do they do exploration and digging deeply in other fields alex in particular uh, works a lot with immigration and um now at his place in Yale University, he's doing a lot of work with immigration from the Caribbean, where he's from. Um, and uh, the, yeah, we also didn't know what a digital humanist was, but it turns out that it's a big field. They have oh. conferences every year. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so they just exercise the humanities in the digital space. And I think XP Method is a good example of that. Yeah, using computation and um, d data visualization, data collection, and then data visualization. Well, it juxtaposes so perfectly with the personal stories. It really adds such an important dimension. Are they? Do you think they're in any jeopardy of their own safety, or are you ever in jeopardy of? Your well, I was I, I was just thinking about that because when you talk about the line within with undocumented, but if anybody here is familiar with Project Twenty Twenty Five from the Heritage Foundation and you know the plans that are laid out for what Trump will do if he gets elected. They're not going to stop with undocumented. They're planning to deport people who have green cards, people who are naturalized citizens. Uh, it's it's you know like a sweep, uh, as Anand said in the film, eight to twelve million people, and that's you know, and it it won't stop there. So the line within is uh, much longer than just undocumented people. But it's interesting too that you didn't let the Democrats off the hook. You made that point that this is deeply embedded in the government. This whole border industrial complex with the the backing of all these companies that you yeah that yeah you showed. I I'm really disappointed in what the Democrats are doing with immigration because they're just playing into the Republican game instead of having a different narrative, a whole different idea about what to do about immigration which would be, you know, order at the border. You know, people can come in and work and go back to their home. I mean, there's so many things that could happen that would not be, uh, you know, a war on immigrants. It could be a way to bring immigrants that we need, that, that are looking for work. We need them to work, uh, you know. That, but it's turned, it just turns into this huge mess, and militarization is really worrisome because, you know, even during the pandemic, uh, as Alex said, the Border Patrol responds only to the president. And the president, when it was Trump, sent them to Portland in the protests in Portland. He sent them to Washington, D.C. So it became like his own personal militia. Yes. And, you know, we wanted to... Um, so when we filmed this, the data was from 2017. But actually, of in all the graphic representations, we where we could, we... Uh, re-researched it using the message methods of the XP method, the digital humanists, and brought all the data up to 2024. And we and um, and now on our website, we're still building it out, but you can find from every single congressional district how much money is coming to them from ICE contracts and who's getting that money. And we did that because we felt that that would be a really good way to organize locally that people could find out where the money was going to in their area of the country and that they could act accordingly. Uh, and, and, and they could petition Democrats and Republicans as well as Democratic representatives. I mean, in your past films, you've been a chronicler and an observer. Here, you're an active human rights activist playing a, playing a, a role in moving the story along. And... Have you ever done that before, and would you will you continue, given your you know your your interest in your history and, and advocacy anyway, and then combining it with your film career, 
uh, it's it's it works beautifully. But I'm just wondering if you are planning to use this kind of combination of your skills in the future. I really had to be an activist, much more of an activist than I've ever been. Well, I think I always was really an activist. It was just wasn't transparent in the films. You know, I didn't think that was an important part. But really, to tell this story, I had to make that really apparent. And I always believe that it's important for filmmakers to go back to people and places where we've made films, that it's important to keep connected, maybe not to make another film, but just to really stay connected. So when Kush, you know, WhatsApped me and said, I, I, I'm being threatened with death and I have to leave the country, and I I told him right away, don't leave. You know, it's too, way too dangerous. I'm in the desert and it, people are dying here. And he said, I've already left. So what could I do except um, help him in any way I could? I didn't know at that point that he was that he was going to be in the film or a big part of the film. I just thought, uh, I have to help him in any way I can. And, you know, we know that whenever you feel impotent to stop human rights violations, the best thing you can do is document them. And then hopefully keep them, archive them for the day when justice can be served. Um, and in a small way, this film is meant to be justice for Kash, to be part of his case, to help him win political asylum. And helping him get a lawyer was, you know, just just p part of that. So I, I guess it would be depending on what is necessary. Um, I always say, you know, as, as human rights defenders, we practice human, our, our human rights practice is in the making of the films. Just like a human rights lawyer uses law to practice their human rights. Um, so we'll continue to do that. I guess whether it'll be obvious or uh, transparent or, or not as transparent. You know, I, I don't like to always be in the films but sometimes it's necessary. Wow. Well, the, um, the time taken, too, to make this film, obviously you're at the mercy of the way the story unfolds. Uh, this film took five years. Did, is that what you anticipated when you began, or what were your preconceived ideas before you started the project? Honestly, we don't ever have a preconceived idea in terms of a timeline, because it's, we just... Um, Kind of follow the story uh, like we did here, uh, as a, in a kind of organic way. How it happens, so, you know, we, uh, as you saw in the film, when Pam realized that Kash had actually arrived in Juarez. From that point, it wasn't uh, the stuff that he was uh, uh, taping on his phone, right? It was he was there. So then we got a crew and went over there, and then we thought, okay, where's this story going to go? And we we thought he'd get over the border with Carlos pretty quickly, and it took another two years, and things like that. So we just had to keep going with it. Yeah, yeah. Are there any questions in the in the audience? Sure there are. <laughs> yes. It's not a question, but it's just a comment on, oh, I'm sorry. That this is not the way we want our country to be. You know, these people are nice people. That they're, they're just, we should be welcoming them. We're a nation of immigrants. Am I right? I, I don't, you know, it, it, I think it's been just overcomplicated. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I wish it wasn't that way. And I also think, um, to your point, we have to uh, give agency for immigrants and immigrant families who are in this country to help shape their destiny and shape the destiny of immigrants who are coming. Why did Gabriella come? I'm sorry, why did she come? You mean adult Gabriella or, or yeah, young? The, the character in the, or young, the woman in the, pl in the movie. Well, she, she, is, she came over originally to... To work. Uh, she to, was a farm worker. She was a farm worker. And uh, then she kind of settled with her husband and had kids and and everything was going okay, as you saw in the in the photos from her childhood. And then he got deported. And that's the story with 
so many women along the border. Uh, so Gavriela was a DACA person. I don't know if you know DACA, Deferred, uh, deferred action. action for... <laughs> For childhood arrivals. So if you uh, come to the United States with your parents as a minor, um, you under the um, Obama administration, you were allowed to have a temporary legal status here. And that's what she had. But um, when she was being pursued by um, the Border Patrol, and when they were trying to remove her from the United States, she lost her DACA status. And that's why, you know, she had to go and she was almost put into detention for months, if not years. But, but that was her story. And that's the story of um, th tens of thousands of children that came with their parents. Minerva. And, and I just want to add to that. that it's one thing that was really sad, and it didn't come out in the film, uh, but in our research, in Mexico City, we went to a place as a center for young Americans, I'll call them, that got deported because they they didn't get in the right date, uh, and they got picked up, and they couldn't, they weren't available, I mean, uh, eligible for DACA, and they got deported to Mexico, and they're in Mexico City. They're really American. They don't speak Spanish well. Uh, you know, they speak English. So they're all working call centers, but they're in, they're not in their country. They're just, you know, they're out. They're, it's it's really tragic, uh, and they really have no place else to go. And, you know, they've just been yanked out of their lives. Uh, hi there. I just want to thank you both, the filmmakers and Wendy, um, everyone in this room, all the advocates in this room, all the folks that are here uh, to learn more or to continue the work that you do to support uh, folks and uh, sort of a humane conversation around immigration. Um, I'm the executive director of a Latino-focused organization called OLA. Uh, we are the only one that is based on the East End, uh, serving um, uh, this sort of rarefied area, which is uh, a, has a huge power and wealth imbalance. Also calls to the many, many immigrants from wherever to come out here because there is work and there is a, a possibility that they can uh, feed and, and, and take care of their families back home. And not only workers, but also bringing their youth, their youth that are excelling in our schools, our 24 districts that hold right now over 50% Latino student body. That's across our entire East End of Long Island. That is our East End, that is our future, part of this beauty that we have around us that we're lucky to have. Um, I wanted to say that I was, I was struck by the, sort of the image um, that the digital humanists uh, created of um, how is it possible that um, we could have the systems that we have that allow this sort of family separation to happen in this systemic way, this very, very strong um, strong machine. And I, and I think about what happened here, because uh, we still are at every stage of, of supporting our immigrant communities out here that have been here for five days, for three generations or more, um, was kind of not so much the detention centers that we might have on the East End, because I don't believe we do, but we do have are a series of policies and laws that were easily, easily toppled. Our constitution was toppled out here when it became very clear that um, we were going to accept administrative warrants, which are not judicial warrants. That is against our constitution. And we found just like dominoes, just like dominoes, um, areas out here, our 10 police departments, our municipalities, our people who didn't want to believe that these things were happening were happening. And they will happen again. So it's just very important to understand that it's not just the building of a detention center, it's our policies, it's our laws, it's sometimes the only thing that we can hold on to that can be some sort of solace. And we have to hang on to that no matter what happens next. And whether it's OLA or another organization, you wanna learn what we're doing, do it. Please be involved and thank you so much again for this film. Thank you so much thank for you. that. Thank you. Yes. And I, I should add to that to that, that um, as part of our impact campaign with the film that is unrolling now, we're making the film available. We have on our website a place where you can request a, a screening, and uh, if you and we have a Spanish version of the film as well. So if you know if Ola wants to do a screening for your constituents, you should yeah you know, let us know. We're with you. Yeah. say luck, but it seems to me that watching a film about two people who had better outcomes than many other 
So this is Definitely. a success story, which is really um, heart wrenching. Um, in this, can you specifically flesh out uh, the scenes? Uh, I don't know if it was state police or ICE or whatever that were breaking up the ICE water and the ICE. I mean the water and who was filming and why you were blocking that out. What that whole thing that was going on there? The people destro destroying the water that had been left on the migrant trails. That was the border patrol. Uh, and that was filmed with motion detection cameras that were placed there by the No More Death people. Um, as a result of that and publicizing that, that widely, as well as their written reports documenting human rights abuses, um, the BORTAC raid came on the No More Deaths humanitarian aid camp. So BORTAC is the tactical unit of the Border Patrol. And um, we, we knew about that raid because Luis Osuna, who we had filmed with before in the desert with the Armadillos, was at the camp then. And the other thing was is um, he told us that there were Bortac men filming it. Um, and so we were like, we want to get that footage. And um, so... I found a lawyer, um, a pro bono lawyer, who would file a FOIA request. And um, when we made the request, the request was Skylight, our human rights organization, Skylight versus the Department of Homeland Security, kind of scary. Um, they said they didn't have anything. But Luis uh, had taken a picture and uploaded it before they took their phones away of the man with the camera, which was a professional camera, and he had like a steady cam kind of rig. And um, so we had this picture that he had uploaded and we were able to salvage, and we showed it to the Justice Department. And then, miraculously, they found the footage. And that's the footage that we were able to use. But it took us two years uh, in that lawsuit, and we had to, our, our lawyers had to eventually sue um, to get it, and that's how we got it. They're the ones that redacted the faces. Yeah, no. And we thought about trying to take the redaction off, but it's creepier with it, right? Yeah. That was another two years. Raiding humanitarian aid camps? They haven't done it in in a while, but whenever no more deaths or others do things that anger them. Um, you know, the BORTAC were, uh, uh, the tactical unit was also deployed to American cities during the summer of 2020, the summer of racial reckoning, the summer of Black Lives Matter, to, um, you know, uh, capture and stop and repress the demonstrations from happening. So um, the, these particular BORTAC this particular BORTAC unit had been in Portland. And remember the governor of Oregon kicked them out of the state and um, they went back to their bases in El Paso and then they were the ones that were called on to raid the humanitarian aid camp. Do we know what happened to those people who were arrested by them? We don't. There were 30 or more. Pro probably got deported. I grew up in Latin America with, under dictatorships and seen that kind of thing happen you know many times and you know for people who think it can't happen here well obviously it can uh, and it, the deployment to Portland was a good example and so yeah I just want to emphasize no matter how we may feel about Biden one way or the other I mean we really have to do everything we can that the vote be big enough that there's no question uh, you know I because uh, I can't imagine the disaster if Trump gets into power. And um, most of your other films, uh, most of your other films have been concentrated in Latin America, and this, I think, is the first time you've put the focus on the U.S. Are you going to continue that in your future work? Do you think? Is well, actually, um, little known fact, I've made quite a few films in the United oh. States. You know, I made a film about the violent white right called Resurgence, which is about the Ku Klux Klan. And I made a, a, a trilogy of films about poor people's movements in America in the 1990s called Living Broke in Boom Times. So 
retrospective. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Actually, not a bad idea. <laughs> so, obviously, following the money the way you guys have, and has that had any effect on your fundraising for the film? Like, have people backed off or who were supportive just changed their um, position because you touched a nerve? We haven't had anybody back off, but but they didn't see the film until the funding had been in place, but I guess. <laughs> so. Well played. <laughs> But you know, um, there are a lot of spaces where we've, well, okay, we've just started to bring the film out, so we don't really know what or if any backlash there's gonna be. Um, but we do know in some spaces where we have tried to place the film, and spaces like film festivals that we've been accepted with open arms before are shutting us out. And I wonder if it's because they're really risk averse in terms of following the money. Um, you know, stay tuned. And it's not, just, it's not just our film. We have many colleagues who submitted films that they completed you know, around the same time as us to festivals, Sundance, South by Southwest, et cetera. And the same chill effect on films that I was, I was astonished. One colleague made an incredible film about the Proud Boys and the, you know, it's January 6th, he was right inside. I thought, wow, what a film that really should be seen this year. It didn't get into any festivals, so it's, you know. So, and then there are many other examples. So this, there, there's a feeling of a chill. But you were saying about funders, but it's also really the, well. The festivals are connected to funders, of course, and that's the thing too. So, but, that's very damning. I, let's hope that I know. that trend reverses quickly. Yeah. We were shocked, frankly. Yeah, we still are. I, I am too. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I mean, funders. No festival should be beholden to their funder to that extent where they're shifting their programming criteria. Right. That's terrible. <laughs> yes. I, I just want to thank you so much for making this film. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming to it. I just deeply moved. And um, I, I just got back from the uh, Arizona-Mexico border. I've been working with asylum seekers for the past few months and working to start a podcast with interviews to try to humanize. Like, like just so seeing this was really moving. And um, I'm curious how, I know you said there's screenings that people can request, but how can we get as many people as possible to see this film? <laughs> what, is there a plan? Well, it's not, yeah, aside from... Requesting a screening, we already have several requests from, say, community groups that, all over Montana, Northern Maine, uh, Kansas. It's really all over the place. It's fascinating to see where they pop up. Um, you know these requests, but also at some point we're going to do a national virtual premiere that can be you know can be watched anywhere in the country um, in a certain window uh, on the streaming platform that we're using. So because we're independent filmmakers, you know, if, if, if you make a film for Netflix and they have editorial control over the film, you're not an independent filmmaker. Um, and to, to, to do this independently is a lot of work. It's tough, but you know, now there are great tools to help do that. So, you know, we're, that's our rollout plan. And in a way, since we've been doing this for 40 years, it's back to the future, right? It's always been this way. Back to the future. Yeah, yeah we're raising money right now for our impact campaign. And um, so we want we want everything. Well, we're going to do a 13-city tour of the United States in small cinemas like the cinema. We're going to have a, another week run at the downtown, um, the DCTV Firehouse Cinema in New York City in September. But what we really want to do, you know, with all organizations is right now we can do a private virtual um, screening, right, online for your constituents or leadership. And um, we want that to build to the national virtual premiere, which will be before the elections. But in the meantime, between now and the elections, we're trying to seed all this, seed organizations, local, state, and national organizations. And also have some cinematic showings, 
You know, because the film was really meant to be, I mean, we filmed it to be seen on the big screen. We know most people won't see it that way, but you know, we still have our pride. By the way, it's fantastic to see it on this screen with yeah, the sound. It's beautiful. Sound. Thank you so much. For, oh, and you, I just want to add, um, if anyone's interested, their Instagram is Border Diaries One. If you want to see it, which is right now from the border. Thank you so much. And ours is Skylight Picks, our Instagram. Yeah. Um, but also, you can always contact us through through Julia or through Wendy. Speaking of the big screen, you, the fact that you chose this widescreen format sort of enhances the extraordinary physical beauty of the landscapes and also the uh, the eeriness of the, you know, the digital humanist. I just thought it was a, an extravagant and wonderful um, decision that you made to to beautify it in a way. Have, have you ever used the, the widescreen format? No, before? our cinematographer, Juan Hernandez, was the one who's really, you know, pushed push us to do it. that. Yeah. And it we're really worked. glad that he oh, yeah. convinced us. Right. <laughs> and you know, it was funny because uh, in the beginning, I didn't really understand it. And I was always working with Juan like it was 16.9, which is, a, you know, more of a, like a letterbox format. Um, and and this is 239. And, um, you know, the way that he was filming and the way people were moving through the frame, I only understood when we got, what came back from the first shoot and I looked at everything and I realized like a lot of the direction I was giving him was wrong for this format. So I adjusted and he was very patient. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned the sound in this place. Do you want to say anything about the music? <laughs> yeah. Um, part of the music is composed and played by Sara Kuruchic, who is a Mayan uh, singer-songwriter, uh, sort of in the tradition of Mercedes Sosa and other Latin American protest singers. And she's on a real uh, clear ascent uh, so, and, and on tour all the time now. So it's really great uh, to see that happen with her. We've known her since she was starting. And she composed like the, the, a lot of the vocals. That's her and uh, rattles and those kind of sounds. And then the other more orchestral music is Roger C. Miller, uh, who's a very eccentric composer that lives in, in Boston. And he's done our scores now for like four or five films. Yeah. He has a, he has a really, we feel he has a really good touch. Yeah. And he plays the guitar very well, too. Thank you so much for this film, which was so enlightening. And I think one of the things, I'm a psychologist, and one of the things that was so wrenching, I could barely watch it actually, was the impact on families, the separation between parents and children. And I know that's been such a huge issue with the camps. And even now we don't know what the fate is of so many children who were separated from their parents and whose lives are altered. I mean, it is a kind of soul murder. And I wonder if that's something that you plan to take up further in your work, um, whether you know of any other documentaries that have been done on this. Um, I know there was a hue and cry from psychologists all over the world about this and many petitions, but I'm not sure it had much impact. Uh, I think that's a really good idea. Um, I don't know of any other films specifically about that. There was a person that we tried to include in this film, Pamela McPherson and Scott Allen, who were, um, they were subcontracted by ICE to go into detention facilities and look at the conditions, and they became whistleblowers and protected government whistleblowers. Um, and they considered how the children were separated and the conditions that they lived under to be sp state-sponsored child abuse. That was the report that they gave. Um, but anyway, I like your idea very much for making it part of the impact campaign and for bringing back um, Pamela and Scott to help us with that. Do you know them? Do you know their work? Yeah, they won a, one of the they won the Physicians for Human Rights award in the year that they were whistleblowers, which was I think 2020, 2019, 2019. 
thing, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, we filmed a lot with them, so yeah. That could possibly be a short film as part of the resources uh, connected to this film. That's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank you both so much for being here and sharing thank this you, film. Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. It's really spectacular. Yeah,